Good morning. Well, you turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 2. The Gospel of Luke chapter 2. This is one of our favorite Sundays of the year as we're all going to be in for a special treat as we recognize and honor and celebrate all of the wonderful work that our young people have done within the last year. The program that we use here at Hickory Knoll is called Lads to Leaders and Leaderettes. This is a, a program in which Thomas will tell you a whole lot of more details a little while later. But in an overall summary, Lads to Leaders is an organized congregational program that instills biblical knowledge, leadership, dedication, commitment, and confidence in the lives of our young people. Now we can look all around us and we can look at young people, children that maybe our kids go to school with or, or maybe that live close to us. And there's a lot of these values that are just not a part of many children's lives. And people around us more times than not, their, their children do not have any type of Bible knowledge Whatsoever, They don't have any type of commitment or, or dedication to, to anything really, but maybe a, a video game or, or some other type of interest. There's really not much confidence more times than not in the lives of many children. But as we at Hickory Knoll pay very close to attention to the development of our children, we place a very high importance and doing our part to share or to transfer biblical knowledge to the next generation, to encourage our young people to do the very best that they can. And they do not need to mope around like there's nothing going for them, but because of their dedication and their commitment to the Lord, they can have confidence to live their lives in a secure way knowing that they are pleasing to God and knowing that they are doing His will. The ultimate goal for any type of youth program or any type of organized event is for young people to grow up and to be faithful to the Lord. Yes, we do have some short-term objectives, but ultimately I think everyone here that is a parent or a grandparent, you desire for your children and grandchildren when they grow up and are on their own and can do whatever they want, you and we all desire for them to choose the Lord and to continue coming to church, not because they have to or forced to, but to continue coming to church because they want to and because they know it's the right thing and not only is it the right thing, it's the very best thing for them in their lives. Last night, Julie and Lance said I do to each other. They, they got married. And, and in that ceremony, Julie's grandfather, uh, both of them led prayers. But in one of them, the grandfather expressed appreciation to the Lord for these two young people making a commitment to each other in marriage. But he prefaced it by talking about how thankful that he was that both of them had made a previous commitment already to put Jesus first in their lives by being Christians and having not only a love for each other, but a love for God. One of my favorite professors over at Harding University, he's pretty much retired now. He may teach a, one class or two a year, but it's a guy by the name of Jimmy Allen. And Jimmy Allen is one who has preached to the hundreds and thousands of people and, and many souls have been converted to Christ because of his lifelong dedication to preaching and teaching the gospel. However, a, a couple of years ago, one of his sons wrote a book entitled Growing Up Church of Christ. And, and in this book, this adult son recounts some positive memories that he had about
about growing up in the church. But unfortunately, this book was predominantly about frustrations and resentments that this adult son now has about the church and as a result is no longer a part of the Lord's church. And Jimmy Allen has found himself just like thousands of other parents throughout the brotherhood asking the question, why has my child decided to no longer be a part of the Lord's church? And I think about all of the wonderful things that, that Jimmy Allen and other parents have done to instill these values. But unfortunately, regardless of all of the time and effort, our children are going to grow up and have to make their own decisions. And there's no magic formula to produce faithfulness, but it is something that we place of high importance in desiring for our young people to, when they grow up and they may decide to get married or stay single or when they move away, go to somewhere else, that they make it a priority to remain faithful Christians in the church. Research in the Brotherhood has shown that teenagers and young people that have been part of an organized youth program are more likely to remain faithful when they get older. And better yet, specifically the Last to Leaders program, the research has shown is that the children that are the result of that program are even more likely to remain faithful to the Lord. Some people have the false idea that that last the leaders is all about convention and competition. But one of the things you'll notice in a little while as we recognize our children, most of them did not compete in any event and most of them did not attend convention. It's all about instilling knowledge and training and leadership and confidence in the lives of our children. This year's theme was will work until Jesus comes. It's a song that we sang a moment ago and it's a song that all of us pay close attention to knowing that we, yes, are looking forward to the day in which Jesus will come back. But it's also reminding us that until that happens, we are going to spend our lives every single day working for our Lord. Knowing that it's the Lord's work it's the Lord's business that we need to be paying attention to. And with all of that said, that brings us to Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse number 39. This is at the very beginning of the gospel. And of course, this is the time in which Jesus is just a very young man, 12 years old. And so this, is, this event is coming several years prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. Several years before he begins conducting his, his earthly ministry in a sense of, of teaching and, and doing miracles and, and things like that. But we pick up Jesus at, at 12 years old. And this, the Bible says this in Luke chapter 2 verse 39. So when they had performed... All things according to the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child, talking about Jesus, grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey. 
and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And Jesus said to them, Why is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then when he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Our sermon this morning is entitled, Lads to Leaders, An Easy Yet Difficult Work. It's easy to conceptualize the importance of making sure our children are active in the Lord's work. It's easy to think about other folks that we may know or examples in our lives in, in which we've seen adults become, children become adults and fall away. And it's easy to conceptually say, you know, I do not want that for my child. I do not want that for my grandchild. And it's easy to think and to know that as an adult, we need to be doing the right thing in supporting and investing in our young people. But when push comes to shove, and when there's an opportunity to do good, and there's an opportunity for us to make a difference in the lives of young people, no matter how much we desire to do it for whatever reason, Things get in the way, events come up, distractions are all around us, and it's something that we desire and want to do, but a lot of times we fall short being distracted by other things that come up in life. It is something that is easy, but it is difficult. It's going to take work. It's going to take effort. And it's going to take us all together, working as, as parents and as the congregation and as the youth in making this an environment, a church family in which our young people are encouraged and motivated to grow in wisdom and in stature and to find favor with God and men. So whose work is it anyway? We know that we are working till Jesus comes, and we know that, yes, this is something that is easy but difficult. But whose job is it anyway? First of all, this morning, I'd like to challenge the parents that are with us that have children and grandchildren in the Lord. What is the parents' relationship to children becoming faithful to the Lord? And Joseph and Mary tend to get a bad rap in this text. They, they tend to, to have a bad reputation because of what is said in verse number 48 about how they were looking for Jesus anxiously and they not knowing where their child was and, and the others uh, not, and they not being able to understand what Jesus, who he was, and what he was trying to do. And, and yes, Joseph and Mary had some learning to do, but I want to suggest to you, or I want to encourage you to notice some of the other items that Joseph and Mary were doing well. Look again in verse number 39 of our text in Luke chapter 2. Joseph and Mary were doing all things 
pertaining to the Lord. And notice again in verse number 41 of how awesome of a job Joseph and Mary were doing when it came to going to Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. They were dedicated to the Lord. They were doing the right things. They were trying their very best. And no parent is going to be perfect. And nobody is going to be just like Jesus in complete perfection. But what we desire is for parents to look at the example of Joseph and Mary. And sure, there's going to be moments in your life as parents that you have some anxiety, you have some unknown questions, that are unknown answers to questions, and you may feel a bit uncomfortable in which of the things your children are doing. But ultimately, Joseph and Mary were striving to do the very best thing for their children. About once or twice a year, I, I get an opportunity to sit in in a courtroom in St. Charles Parish. And, and just this last week, I, I was there doing a couple of things, and, and the item on the agenda was truancy. And we all know what, what truancy is. It, it's, it's when a child is absent from school. Well, there was a mom that walked in to the courtroom with her two children. One was six years old, and the another was seven years old. And so they were there, all looking real good, real sharp, and you can't help but wonder, man, why, what is going on? Why are these children not in school? And so first the judge didn't like the fact that the mom brought the children. I guess she was trying to try to soften the, the judge's heart, I suppose. But the judge basically asked the question, why is it? that your two children have missed 28 days of school since January. And, and we think about the scenario like that and we say, you know, what is wrong with that parent? What kind of parent allows their child to miss school 28 days, 28 days in less than one school year? And so the judge in her way was able to encourage and reprimand and motivate the child or the children and the parents to go to school. And so as they were dismissed and walking out of the courtroom, the little seven-year-old looked up to his mom and says, does this mean we have to start going to school now? And the mom said, yes, uh, you're going to school. In fact, you're going this afternoon. But we look at something like that and say, how absurd. Who, what kind of parent would let their children miss that much school? But as the very same idea, we want to be parents that, yes, send our children to school, but we want to be parents that go with our children to church as well. And truancy is not something we measure, and you'll never be sent to court for it. But it is something that is of utmost concern when parents choose not to be at church, and even worse, when parents choose to allow their children to stay home from church. We want to be doing the right thing, and there's distractions that are all around us, but let's make a commitment to continue doing all things pertaining to the Lord, as Joseph and Mary were, and to continue making worship a priority every single week. Secondly, this morning, as we ask the question, whose work is it? Yes, the parents have a role, but I want to challenge all of us to understand that the church has a role as well, specifically us here at Hickory Knoll. The congregation has a part in instilling faith and values into the lives of our children. Unfortunately, many of our young people that come to church here do not have both parents attending with them. Sometimes a young person is here without either one of their parents with them, and we commend that and we encourage the children to continue being a part of church. 
But sometimes there's some frustration and you, we may occasionally hear a little bit of clamor and a little bit of, of frustration. And, and they, sometimes folks make the comments, well, it's not the church's job to babysit the children. And, and you're exactly right. What we do here at church should never replace your role as a parent, as the primary caregiver in the lives of the children. But when we think about the idea that sometimes parents are not doing their job, we're faced with a dilemma. Do we continue letting them, not of encouraging their children to be a part of church, or do we as a congregation make a specific effort to reach out to the children because we want them, and also to reach out to the parents as well. And yes, it may look like babysitting at times, but that is not what it's about. The bigger picture is connecting children and parents to the church. So yeah, sometimes there are games and sometimes there's trinkets and sometimes there's treats and there's food and there's candy and, and all the things that children enjoy, but those are all just introductory items to get them here and to allow for the church to connect with them in the desire of them growing in wisdom, in stature, in the Lord, having favor with God and men. We want all of our children to be like Jesus, but we quickly are reminded as we see what Jesus is doing in the text that Jesus, yes, he was the son of man, but he was the son of God. And at 12 years old, he was able to be there in the temple and able to teach the things of God because he was God himself. But we realize that our children are not perfect. And we realize that in the congregation, there's going to be times in which we know that children are not always going to make the best decisions. And so it makes it even more important as we think about the role of the church. Notice again verse 46 of our text in Luke chapter 2. It was Jesus in the temple... And he was sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And so Jesus is able to teach them some things that they did not already know. But we see the idea of making sure that a child is surrounded by godly people. And in our Bible classes and in our worship services, we, we put our children, we give them the opportunity to sit in the midst of teachers. And, and we give our children the opportunity in Bible class to listen to the stories from the Bible. And we give them opportunities to ask questions to things they do not no. Ideally, all of this would be happening at home and at church, but unfortunately, more times than not, the only time Bible questions and answers and stories are discussed at church. We can be angry about that, we can be upset about that, but we also can accept our role and responsibility as a church family in instilling knowledge and faith in our children. Outside research shows that a young person needs about five or six adults in a church family to have a good influence on them. So even if the parents are doing the very best that they can, there's still a need for that young child to see other adults be a part of the church and to see other adults have the opportunity to live faithfully and to instill that knowledge. Third and finally this morning as we ask whose work is it? It is the parents' work and it is the congregation's work. But it's also the youth's work as well. 
What is the young person's relationship to the work of the church? And to the young people that are here this morning, you need to know, as we look at this text in Luke chapter 2, that Jesus was not yet a man, yet he was a child. And as a child, he was doing the right things. And as a child, he was growing and developing his faith. In other words, Jesus did not wait till he became an adult to start living for God. Young people this morning, you need to know that your parents and your church family are pulling for you, but none of us can do it for you. And that you can start now asking questions, learning about the Bible, and being a part of the church in Bible class and in worship and being a part of trying to be like others in the church who are doing the right thing. So I challenge our young people this morning to listen to your teachers in Bible class. Follow along if you can in the sermons and, and try to learn as much as you can. And if worst case scenario, you're in a situation where you want to come to church, but your parents are not, respectfully ask them if you can call and get a ride from someone who will bring you. Don't do it in a hateful or an angry way, but simply ask them respectfully for permission to come to church even when they are not. Verses 40, verse 40 in Luke chapter 2, Jesus grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. Verse 49 in our text, Jesus in doing the work of the Father. Verse 51, Jesus being subject to his parents. Verse 52, Jesus increasing in wisdom and stature, doing all of these things as a youth. As a young person, as a non-adult, Jesus making the decision to live for the Lord. As we close this morning, we understand that connecting with our youth, it is easy in a sense, but it is difficult as well. I'm hoping and praying that all of us can continue doing our parts. Parents do our parts. Congregation, we can do our part. And the, to the youth, you can do your part as well. As all of us strive to work until Jesus comes, focusing primarily on the Lord's business because there is nothing else in this world that is more important than living for God and doing his work. This morning we do have a song of invitation and it has been selected and it's a way to encourage you to become a Christian by believing in Jesus, repenting of sins, confessing faith, and, and being baptized into Christ. Or it's an opportunity for anyone that is already a Christian to come back to the Lord by living for him again, repenting of sin, and praying to the Lord. If we can help you in any way, will you come forward this morning while we stand and while we sing together?